You know, in my experience in uh, interfaith dialogue and in religious disaffiliation, that word missionary is very negative. <laughs> so <laughs> we use it a lot, and I think uh, that's it's very negative, as um, uh, because it gives these images of imposing one's faith on others. La nostra presenza in missione non deve essere vista della conversione, ma di dare testimonianza, cioè che loro vedano in noi un qualcosa di diverso che possa suscitare curiosità e dire ma eh, cosa hai tu che sembri essere diverso da, da, da noi? Cosa c'hai? It's how we become, ok? Beacons of the presence of God. How do we embody the message of the gospel? Uh, not only in this uh, looking for conversions, but rather to even help people to have a human dignity, which they acknowledge, which hopefully in the time of God may lead them, you know, to say, hey, I want to live that style of life. But it's not just about the numbers. It is not about just how many people you convert or how many people you baptize. Are you helping people to become better people even in their own faiths? And this relationship uh, will make you probably or hopefully a better missionary and a better person, a better Christian. And if they are Christians, hopefully a better Christian. If they are not Christians, a better Muslim or a better Buddhist. And uh, our charism, in a sense, is really about answering a deep human need in the human family. And we kind of put this in a slogan called, Make the World a Human Family. And that is really, um, has, addresses the deep divides and fissures and divisions in our society and the world around us which has never gone away. Uh, a special friend of mine, uh, who we met um, at the Paul University many, many years ago when I was a student. Um, she has been a Buddhist, okay, and she's a Buddhist uh, you know, since uh, she was a kid. And through her process of life, she, she was always sharing with us the seminarians and hanging around with us and going to prayer and you know visiting our communities etc etc uh, now she has engaged in this process uh, of yearning towards becoming a buddhist monk a female buddhist monk which there are not many okay and um, sharing with her it is you know it's pretty good to, to, to try to share our own journeys of faith and how it, you know, she, through her own uh, desire to get closer to God, engaged in this experience of faith. And is of course, in the Buddhist tradition, but she has encountered a deeper, a deeper sense of herself and a deeper sense of her faith. Um, and if you ask me, well, you know, uh, she has found God in deeper ways, uh, you know, uh, than before, and that is pretty good. Wow, I'm not too fancy in wrapping things like that. <laughs> well, yeah, it looks like uh, he's done maybe the short. Harry Yoga. <laughs> I don't even know who gave it to me. Maybe they gave it to Susan, Susan gave it to me, and gave it to you. <laughs> <laughs> That's cute. Uh, and in the Philippines, it's not so, it's interreligious, but in a different way. You know, it's predominantly Christian, really, in name. <clears throat> 
But um, I had an experience there. We were working in justice and peace work. In the market. So there was this movement that uh, in the Philippines, which was global, it was going on in Indonesia, and it was going on in Brazil, and that is helping landless farmers gain their own land. So it brought them in conflict with landowners. And um, during that particular time, uh, there was a clandestine army that was really the Philippine army uh, who would murder the leaders of this movement. Uh, and um, that's what they did. Uh, more than 300 people were murdered. And so we were with them. Their widows came up to our place, which is near the government seat uh, in the Philippines and held a hunger, hunger strike. They shaved their heads and they held a hunger strike on the highway in front of the government building. So they called me and an imam to go there after 15 days in their hunger strike. We didn't know what the heck to do, <laughs> to be quite honest. So what we did instead is we read from our sacred scriptures. He read from the Quran, and I read from one of Paul's letter to the Romans. And then we decided not to do any group thing, but they were all lying in cots because they were weak. But just we would go around to each cot and talk to these women just personally in these in these um, hushed whispers, you know. Um, and just listening to them and to their stories. When I, th when I think about it, I want to cry again. <laughs> Sorry. So anyways, at the end of it, you know, it was just, that was a powerful experience for me. So much so that I began to see the power of the interfaith voice. I, I, it was there. It was a voice. I could not do that on my own. It can only, because some of these women were Muslim because they came from the South and Southern Philippines. Islam is much stronger. Uh, so, uh, but that interfaith voice, which I talk, to, which I talk about a lot, uh, the power of that voice, I experienced for the very first time. Uh, and I decided right there <laughs> that what I was going to do when I came back here uh, was to focus my attention uh, completely on uh, interfaith. And uh, so I've been trying to do that ever since. E quindi il, l'essere l'informato su quello che va nel mondo, succede nel mondo, eh, mi, interessa, mi interessa e mi sembra anche doveroso, eh, anche perché eh, quando vado fuori per il ministero, con la situazione per esempio che c'è adesso eh, in Ucraina, eh, non posso ignorarla, capito? E quindi anche... Eh, eh, far capire alla gente che è importante per noi percepire la sofferenza di questa gente e cercare di farla nostra è per me importante. And in some ways um, I would like to, to think of our charism today presently with the metaphor of reconciliation. And reconciliation is really about reconciling disparate parts. And that's not just, uh, and that can mean many things to many people. Uh, from my point of view, as an interfaith leader, uh, my point of view, that of course has to do with the extraordinary pluralism and diversity by which the human family has such difficulty with. is about, uh, about uh, bringing together the voices of those who left the church. And I continue to do that. I've had nine interviews this past week, and I have a whole bunch this next week coming up. I think I, most of my friends are ex-Catholics anyways, okay? So, anyway, so I would like to pray in a particular way for this extraordinary time that we have as a church to move forward. And for this I pray to the Lord, Lord.
Pluralism ignites anxiety. And uh, you can either um, embrace it or repel it. <laughs> and religion has done both for many centuries. So, but in our view today, I think in this 21st century, what I'm interested in is how our charism is an answer to the prayers of people who are seeking unity and peace among us. And religions have been both a cause of pain and a cause of consolation, joy, and um, strength and courage. So um, I think in a lot of ways, we're not the only ones doing this. I'm doing this also with other peoples of other faiths who have very similar dreams than we do. But our charism is basically about that. And our community life is all about encouraging and nurturing that.